Harriet Tubman began her life in the bonds of slavery, but lived her life helping others achieve their freedom. She really helped black people have a sense of um, self, a sense of freedom, and a sense that, you know, slavery was not right. Araminta Harriet Ross was born into slavery around 1820 in Dorchester County, Maryland. As a child, she was loaned out to different plantations. By the time she turned 12, she was working in the fields. In 1844, she married John Tubman, who was a free black man, a fairly common occurrence in Maryland. Harriet was determined to escape her life of slavery, and in 1849, she finally did it. She risked her life by making her way from Maryland to Philadelphia. She followed the North Star and used the so-called Underground Railroad to make it to freedom. Lord, I'm a pilgrim. The Underground Railroad was an organized group of free blacks, whites, and Christian abolitionists who helped slaves escape to the North. Harriet had made it to the promised land. No one would have blamed her if she never returned to the South, but she desperately wanted to free her family. She made perilous trips back to free her two brothers, her sister, and her sister's two children. Harriet was clever as she was brave, figuring out countless tricks to bring many slaves to freedom over the next several years. The fact that she developed these paths and trails that took people through the country and they traveled at night and they used quilts to, to have secret codes and, and know the paths and then to bring people north across the Mason-Dixon line into Ohio um, to find freedom. So she was a pioneer and I think a very, very strong woman. Her legendary status as an Underground Railroad conductor earned her the nickname Moses. Well, I think Harriet Tubman's uh, name Moses, you know, comes from Moses from the Bible leading people to freedom. And it's a very, very proper name, I think, for her and, and one that she definitely lived up to. Douglas's life sort of stands across the expanse of the 19th century as a symbol of the worst and the best in the American character. He was the slave who saw most of the worst brutalities of slavery. He was the slave, however, who freed himself and by luck, pluck, and gifts remade himself. Most importantly, he had an enormous ability to capture in words the meaning of what America is about. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs, and it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. Frederick Douglass, 1845. It was along the eastern shore of Maryland near Quiet Creek, called the Tuckahoe, that the life of the man who would inspire a nation began. Frederick Douglass was born in Talbert County on Maryland's eastern shore. He wasn't certain of his birth himself. In fact, he thought that he had been born in 1817. But slave records tell of the birth of Frederick Augustus to a slave named Harriet in February 1818. Douglas described his first days of freedom in New York. After an anxious and most perilous but safe journey, I found myself in the big city of New York, a free man. No man now had the right to call me his slave, or assert his mastery over me. I lived more in one day than in a year of my slave life. It was a time of joyous excitement. Despite his joy, 
New York remained a dangerous place for runaway slaves, since slave catchers watched the wharves. Warned of these dangers, Douglas was soon sheltered by David Ruggles, an ardent enemy of slavery who helped freedom seekers on the Underground Railroad. Seized with a feeling of great insecurity and loneliness, I saw in every white man an enemy, and in almost every colored man, cause for distrust. When Douglas arrived, Manhattan was a much smaller island. Landfill claimed parts of the river shore. Hudson Waters then covered the very spot where you now stand. This area has been renamed Frederick Douglass Landing to recall the enslaved fleeing the South on the Underground Railroad. Sojourner Truth Truth was born into slavery. She made her escape in late 1826 with her daughter Sophia. She later said, I did not run off, for I vowed think that was wicked, but I walked off believing that to be all right. Before she escaped, Truth said, The spirits call me. She claimed that she received a message from God to spread the word of abolition. A picture of Truth when she was a child with her family. At the time, her name was Isabella Womfrey, given by her master. She changed her name after her escape. Soon after her escape, Truth helped recruit black troops for the Union Army. She also worked hard to improve the conditions for African Americans there. Sojourner Truth joined the Northampton Association of Education and Industry in Massachusetts. This was an industry for women's rights and religious tolerance. Just as Mother Teresa preached about her beliefs, so did Truth. Truth delivered powerful speeches to spread her beliefs. She spoke her best known speech known as Ain't I a Woman in 1851 at the Ohio Women Rights Convention. She worked with many people such as the President of the United States at the time, Abraham Lincoln, and also Frederick Douglass. Her contributions made a big effect on abolishing segregation and discrimination in the United States. At 52 years old, the boy born in a cabin was heading for the White House. Southern states, where slavery was key to the way of life, were furious. Within weeks of his election, 11 states left the Union. The first was South Carolina. This began a process, almost like a fall of dominoes, where one by one the other southern states joined South Carolina in seceding from the Federal Union. They said, we cannot be a part of a nation that has elected, and they said, an abolitionist president. There's no way that Abraham Lincoln in 1860 was an abolitionist. He had said over and over again that he was not going to allow slavery to expand into the territory. From the standpoint of Americans, whether we're talking about Americans in the North or Americans in the South, the territory represented America's future. So said differently, what Abraham Lincoln was really saying is, I am not going to allow slavery to expand into America's future. From the standpoint of the South, what he was saying was, I want slavery to die eventually. Again and again, Lincoln had pledged that he would not interfere with slavery. Constitutionally, he couldn't, but the South did not believe him. They were convinced that he would use his powers to destroy their way of life. The rebel states of the South, now separate from the North, renamed themselves the Confederate States of America. Civil war was now a very real threat. United States troops still had a foothold in the South. They were occupying Fort Sumter, a small island garrison controlling Charleston Harbor in South Carolina. The newly formed Confederate Army was determined to remove them. Reunion of North and South had been the battle cry so far, but it was becoming clear that this was not enough. At the end of the summer of 1862, Lincoln wrote a memorandum on the will of God. Now was the time for Lincoln to make the bravest decision of his presidency. 
Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was made public in September 1862. It announced that from the beginning of the next year, all slaves in any state still in rebellion shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. It did not apply to the border states, and it was not obeyed by the rebels, but it succeeded in doing what Lincoln had intended it to do. It reinforced the will of the Union Army to fight on. The Emancipation Proclamation was this blanket order. Come to me and you will be free. Said to the slaves, get to the U.S. lines. At that point, you are automatically free. And slaves came by the tens of thousands. The last speech of Abraham Lincoln's life, he talked about the possibility of providing citizenship rights to African Americans, especially those African Americans who had participated as soldiers in the war. An actor called John Wilkes Booth heard that speech. A Confederate sympathizer, he was infuriated at Lincoln's plans and regarded the president as dangerous. The war now over, Lincoln allowed himself a rare evening of relaxation at the theater. But a night of celebration for the president was to end in tragedy for America. Abraham Lincoln, the first president to be assassinated in office, left America a reunited nation but a shattered country. 600,000 soldiers were killed in the Civil War, and vast swathes of America lay in ashes. The country had to be rebuilt, but without Lincoln, the United States would have ceased to exist completely. He kept the Union together, and above all, he sets us that dramatic example that we are still a republic in which the humblest can aspire to rise to the highest position in the land. He not only embodies the American dream, in many ways Abraham Lincoln is the American dream.